The Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and we pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. We offer respect to the Métis and all who have lived on this land and made Lethbridge their home. So today, this year, marks the 57th year of the Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs, a volunteer organization which I know many of you are familiar with and which continues to bring topics of interest from the local, regional, provincial, national, and even international level, so current and relevant topics. Our session today will be focusing on a topic that's close and near to the hearts of many of us, I'm sure, on the, can the Alberta healthcare system uh, survive without the government's proposed restructuring of Alberta health services? Our speaker today is Chris Galloway, and I think most of you know him since he has spoken to us before. The only thing I will add uh, as we introduce him, he grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan, so that's a solid reference. Since I know some of you in this room grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan or Alberta, and I grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan, so he's a solid guy, I'll tell you that. So the session will now begin. We'll have Chris deliver his message. I think that's the favorite bio I've ever had. Uh, that's awesome. I think that'll work. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's great to be back in Lethbridge and back at SACPA and see so many uh, familiar faces in the room and some new folks, too. Uh, and just before I start, you know, the land acknowledgement was up, uh, but it's always great to be back in Treaty 7. And I think it's worth just taking a moment. You know, last Monday we had the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, but the work isn't just on one day. It's all the time. So I would just encourage you when you leave here, you know, think about what maybe you can do. Maybe go read the calls to action around health. There's seven of them from the TRC report. Because uh, we can't move forward with universal public health care for all if we don't acknowledge the harm the healthcare system has done and the work we need to do to repair that harm. So please just take a moment to do that. Uh, otherwise, I will dive into the presentation. Uh, as it was said, I'm Chris Galloway. I'm from Friends of Medicare. Many of you know Friends of Medicare, but in case you don't, Friends of Medicare, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization here in Alberta. We've been around for 45 years, so not as long as SACPA, but quite a few years fighting for public health care in the province. And the message I bring today is similar to one I brought previously, that we are in a concerning and urgent situation in health care. Fancy clicker works, great, okay. So what I hear, I travel all over the province in this job, I talk to folks in rural, urban uh, communities all over the place, and what I hear everywhere is that Albertans are increasingly worried about accessing the healthcare they need. Whether that's a family doctor, whether that's surgeries, whether that's cancer treatment, whether that's testing, whether that's flu vaccines now and shots. There's all these issues that Albertans are talking about, saying I can't get the care I need when I need it, I'm waiting in pain, I don't know where to go. That's what they're talking about, but it's not what our government is talking about or addressing in their decisions. So I talked about this last time, but it's worth repeating. What we're seeing from an agenda from our provincial government is an age-old strategy. You break it and then you privatize it. They're allowing this chaos to happen it's shaking, but I don't know why. Uh, they're allowing this chaos to happen. They're allowing folks to say, I'm really, really worried. And then they're coming to Albertans and saying, we have a solution. We're going to use our public health care dollars, and we're going to give it to for-profit providers to deliver care. And that's going to solve all of the issues. That's the agenda they've been implementing since they've been elected and that they're doing right now. And we need to call that out and be aware that that's what's really happening. Because what they're saying to Albertans is they have the solutions, and they're implementing them. But so far, all of their solutions are making the problems worse. And the other thing that's happening is the massive restructuring of Alberta health care, yet another go around of restructuring health care in Alberta. This was the simplest chart I could find to explain what they're doing that they've put out. 
But what they're doing is exploding AHS into four different sectors. They're going to have these integration councils. They're going to have a minister and then an associate minister. They're going to have boards and CEOs. There's a transition team. There's all these different pieces happening as they pull it all apart. You know, sounds really seamless, right? It's going to be great. Uh, even they've admitted that's a problem. They now have uh, appointed Dr. Lyle Oberg, a former conservative cabinet minister, to do a seamless patient experience review to figure out how patients are going to navigate this new chaos they're creating, pulling the system apart with all these different sectors and providers. So that is the agenda. We're going to talk more about this today. But that is what they're doing. They're going to have uh, a primary care, acute care, mental health and addictions, and continuing care as four separate sectors not working in one system, and then contracting out underneath of that. But the other thing, and I want to acknowledge, especially here in southern Alberta, that they talked about a lot before announcing this, that it was really about, you know, moving to AHS meant rural places often felt like they didn't have as much say over their health care, not having health regions. That was the feedback they talked about a lot. It's like, oh, we need to give a local voice. And what they've done in this huge restructuring plan is tweaked the local advisory councils to have a new name, they're not a governing body. They don't deliver care. They have no uh, say or influence over the system. And they're saying, oh, good, now there's local input. That's what this is about. It's not about that at all. They've basically done nothing to ensure communities have a stronger voice in the system. If anything, they all have less of a voice navigating multiple systems at once. So I just wanted to acknowledge that quickly. But I'm going to talk about the sectors that they're creating. Recovery Alberta being the first. And just before I talk about Recovery Alberta, I just want to make it clear where we stand at Friends of Medicare. We think addictions care is health care. We think your mental health is health care. It's not some separate thing, separate from your health care that needs to be dealt with over here. It's all part of your health and well-being and should be provided by a health care system with skilled professionals. But there's no clearer example of what they're doing and their real agenda with this restructuring than Recovery Alberta, which officially took over on September 1st after many delays. And so I will not read this all out to you. There's many words on a couple slides. Just for your, if you're bored, you can read that while I talk. Um, but they've moved to Recovery Alberta, this new entity, new sector for mental health and addictions. There's a CEO and a board set up. They're in charge of this care. There's been some hiccups with email addresses and payroll and other administrative things. But overall, they've taken over. But what Recovery Alberta really is, first of all, doesn't mention mental health anywhere in the name or, or priorities. Uh, it's supposed to be our mental health agency. But second, it's a very ideological project that is anti-harm reduction, that is pro-abstinence-only forced treatment, that is pro-private for-profit operators. It's really creating an industry for them to subcontract all of the services to private providers. And that's how the government see these, sees these new four sector agencies, that they're not to deliver care to contract people to deliver care. That is this transition that's underway. So what we have now is for-profit recovery centers operating with contracts with Recovery Alberta. A super clear example of what's really happening was in Gunn, Alberta. It's a place, not a weapon, a uh, community of Gunn, Alberta. There was a male treatment center for uh, men who were experiencing homelessness. When the UCP won, they closed it, laid off all the workers, shuttered that facility. And this summer, it reopened with a for-profit operator that they contracted to run that infrastructure. They did a big press conference saying, look, we're expanding treatment beds in Alberta. No, you flipped them. You closed a public facility and opened a for-profit one. That's what they're doing in this agenda. It's not about increasing access. It's about who's providing the care. And that's true throughout. You may have heard of the My Recovery app. It's this app that they're forcing folks to use who are doing treatment programs. It's a privately owned app that owns our data. There's been a lot of investigative journalism about what that means. It's like they will own everyone who accesses addictions care. They will own their personal health and data. The government does not have access to that. The private company does. And they're doing that throughout. There's private curriculum development. There's private training institutes. There's private addictions care in our corrections facilities now. These are all multi-million dollar contracts that they're doling out to their friends to take over addictions care in Alberta. And it's unregulated care. In Alberta, there's no regulation over who can be an addictions counselor. It's not a regulated profession. Anyone in this room tomorrow could put up a sign and say, come to me for your addictions counseling. I'll provide it. Give me 200 bucks. 
That's the system we have. And that was a choice they made to stop the regulation of addictions care. And they've even gone a step further to create this new idea of a recovery coach as a health professional. A few hours training, you can be a recovery coach, and you're part of this Alberta recovery model. That's playing out in front of us. So it's unregulated, ununionized, private, for-profit. We don't even control the information at the end of the day. That's what they've been rolling out at high speeds with this Alberta recovery model. And they even went so far as to make a new crown corporation called CORE that's supposed to evaluate the success of their own model. They made it a crown so that it wouldn't be accountable to the public. And they're going to churn out like a war room. You may have heard of that before in Alberta. They're going to churn out information claiming this is a huge success and we're paying for that research. So the Recovery Alberta, the first of the four sectors to go, has laid out clearly that their agenda is about profit, it's not about care, it's about deregulating, and so on. So I'm going to quickly talk about some of the other sectors just so it's not just about this one, but I do want to talk about continuing care. What's happening in this province tells us that Alberta seniors deserve a lot better than what they're getting in long-term care in this province. We saw Auditor General reports last year, two of them, that used words like shameful and shocking with what's happening in long-term care facilities in our province. The big issue being workforce and how horrible the jobs are to provide that care. So what was the government's response to those Governor Gen or Auditor General reports? Not the Governor General, different person. Auditor General reports? They're like, okay, we'll act. So they passed a new Continuing Care Act, and they moved quickly to pass legislation that would protect the private care homes from being sued for the deaths that happened during the pandemic. That was their top priority, protecting those providers. And then recently, they moved to put new regulations to go with the new Continuing Care Act. Those regulations remove all minimum hours of care from legislation and regulation in Continuing Care Homes. There's now no minimum required hours of care in our regulations in Alberta. They were already shamefully low, and now they're gone. They've refused to adopt the new national long-term care standards that came out of the pandemic. Uh, they're just ignoring those. They're voluntary, so they're like, nope, we're not interested. And we still have a scenario where the majority of workers in long-term care homes are precarious jobs. They're casual, they're working two, three, four jobs to get by. They don't have benefits, they don't have sick days. They're working short all the time, which means care needs are not being met. That's the issue the Auditor General said we needed to address. We've done the opposite. We've deregulated, we've privatized further. They also then closed the office of the seniors advocate. So if you have a complaint, now there's nowhere to go. So if you have an issue in the system, well, we removed that avenue from you too, uh, good luck. And then we saw in the leaked cabinet slides when all this was being announced about AHS that their plan is to privatize what's left of public long-term care in this province. They removed that from the announcement, but it was very clear in the cabinet slides that's the agenda that they're pushing forward. So it's the exact same agenda in continuing care as it is in mental health and addictions. Deregulate, turn more over to private profit, protect them from any consequences of their actions. And then I'll talk about acute care and primary care briefly, do them together so that we can get to questions, because you always have many questions here at SACPA. So we saw in the recent budget, in terms of infrastructure, a cancelling of a bunch of projects, the South Edmonton Hospital being the most notable. So we're not building the public infrastructure we need as the population booms. The big news story that we've been hearing a lot about the last couple of weeks is they haven't moved forward on the new physician compensation model uh, for family medicine, and there's clear consequences to that, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but they're also looking at all the different ways they can bring private operators into acute and primary care. There's, they funded the development of a business proposal in Airdrie for $85,000 from One Health, a private entity to pitch that they would operate a private urgent care center in Airdrie. And the government has now accepted the proposal they funded. So we're gonna have the first ever privatization of hospital services happening in Airdrie with an urgent care center run by a private operator that is attached to a membership clinic. So they're looking at that. They're also looking at other privatization schemes for hospitals. Up in Beaver Lodge, there's this scheme where we're gonna rent it back. Uh, in Red Deer, the only hospital where they actually funded in the budget, coincidentally, the minister's riding. Um, 
that hospital project, phase two is a public-private partnership. So everywhere they can find it, they're finding a way to bring in someone to make a profit off of our public health care dollars. They're massively expanding private surgical centers, tens of millions of dollars a year in public money going to those for-profit centers. And there was that uh, clip leaked from her UCP town hall, the premiers, where she talked about turning over hospitals to Covenant Health or other private operators, and the AHS wouldn't deliver hospital care at all. That's how they envision the future in our province. And the other piece around primary care is that they have not moved forward in any sort of way to ensure we have some sort of team-based care system at the community level. Instead, they make one-off announcements with each profession separately, pharmacists, nurse practitioners, et cetera, to further divide folks rather than bringing folks together to get better care. But you know, people will say to me, surely this is about improving patient care. That's what they claim their goal is. They put out leaflets to your mailbox saying they're gonna fix your access to health care. But it's not. It's about privatization. It's about for-profit operators. It's about union busting. It's about all of those things. Is what they're actually implementing, they're not implementing solutions. So it's really about profit. That's their priority, is ensuring profit for certain folks. And there's many examples of it. The private surgical centers being a key example of who's benefiting from this agenda tens of millions of dollars of increases per year. Every year is what's happening. It's private ambulance transfer services who have contracts. It's laundry, it's food services, it's Dynalife who walked away with a boatload of money. And it's these clinics and others who are moving aggressively towards fee for service in terms of charging us. Membership fees for clinics, access fees, fees to get your testing done. All of these things are insured services that should not have a fee. But that's where we're moving. We have 40 clinics in Alberta operating right now that have some form of a membership fee restricting access. And it's also about profit for some huge entities. You know, I heard it said recently that uh, the premier is nickel and diming frontline workers and rolling out the red carpet for Shoppers Drug Mart. And that's what's happening. We have healthcare brought to you by Loblaws. The premier stood at a press conference with Shoppers Drug Mart to excitedly announce 103 new pharmacy-led uh, clinics that should deal with the lack of family doctors. People could go there, that'll be fine, go to Shoppers. We saw the vaccine announcement recently, going to pharmacists, not to doctors or nurse practitioners, because it's about them charging for that service. We've seen Shoppers announce a new innovative approach that they're testing in Alberta, where five sites are doing lab testing, and the innovation is that you can pay get it on site, not send it to the actual labs, uh, but you know, there's a fee, that's their innovation, for an insured test that should be a public test. There's other examples of them having tactics like doing drug checks, trying to get people to switch over to them and then billing the public system for that. And there was a very startling article in the Progress Alberta, the Progress Report, uh, that showed that the AHS bureaucrats have also been pushing mental health folks to get people to switch their prescriptions over to the shoppers in downtown Edmonton. So they're actually pushing people to shoppers behind closed doors. And it's not just Loblaws that sees an empire in healthcare that they're trying to build in every corner of the system. It's Telus Health, it's Maple. There's these huge corporations that see a business opportunity in healthcare, and we have a premier who's helping them do it. Mm -hmm. And the impact of all this, of the restructuring, of the chaos, of the private profit, is that our workforce issues are getting worse. And there's no clear example of this. And if you see the Calgary Herald today, there's a multi-page spread about the private surgical initiative and how it's actually meant we've done fewer surgeries in Alberta because it's pulled out our hospital capacity. You don't create new surgeons and new anesthesiologists and new nurses by building a private center, you just rip them out of our hospital, right? So check that out. So that's the clearest example, but it's throughout the system. Fragmenting it, contracting it out, makes our workforce issues worse. And that's the real issue. That's the real issue in our healthcare system is we don't have the doctors and the skilled health professionals to provide the care we need, especially for a booming population. And we don't have a government willing to make a workforce plan like other jurisdictions have done. One that looks at respect, that sets a table. One that looks at retention as a top priority so we stop losing folks. And then look at recruitment, training, and how we can get 
the healthcare workers we need where we need them, including in Lethbridge and other jurisdictions in the province. We're not doing that work. Other provinces are. How many people know a doctor who's moved to BC? There's a reason, right? There's a clear reason that's happening and we're ignoring the real issue. And I just wanna make it clear, I don't like using the word crisis because I think it's used a lot right now, but we are in a retention crisis. When you have the AMA saying the system is going to collapse if you do not act, and they put out this handy chart while calling on the government to act, this shows, if you can see it, uh, that the majority of doctors in Alberta are looking at leaving in the next few years, and a huge percentage of them are already taking steps to close their practice. And we know of two more here in Lethbridge just the other day who said, the refusal of the government to move forward on a new compensation model means we're out. Sorry, we're leaving. It's untenable to stay in Alberta. They're now some of the worst paid doctors in the country with the highest workloads. That's what's happening. So it is a real crisis. We need to invest money right now to sign that deal and stabilize our healthcare system or it's only gonna get worse and rapidly. And, but when I talk about this, it's often someone, maybe they look like this, uh, who says, but how will we pay for that? You know, Heaven forbid we spend any money on healthcare as though there's no money to be found. So I just wanted to talk about where we could be spending money better for a moment. You know, The fact we have a huge multi-billion dollar surplus might be a place to start in this crisis. The fact that they gutted the revenue with the corporate tax cut that didn't create jobs, those are some places to start. But I have some other examples in healthcare I just wanna, wanna point to. This restructuring, for instance. They've admitted it's going to cost $85 million, so it'll definitely cost more than that. You know, with these reviews and transition councils and 16 associate deputy ministers in health and all these other pieces. We're spending a lot of money to blow up the system rather than stabilize it. Privatization, also pretty expensive. I mentioned Dynalife earlier. We know of $97 million that it cost us to undo that privatization of our labs, to not provide better labs, just to spend $97 million. And the other chart on there is uh, from Ontario, because here in Alberta, we don't really give out data or evidence or information to the public uh, for the decisions we make. But in Ontario, they discovered they're spending three times as much on a surgery in a private for-profit surgical center as it costs them to do it in a public hospital. Three times as much. That's a huge differential. And that's the model we're pushing in Alberta, is moving everything to these surgical centers. Think of the cost of that versus actually staffing up our hospitals, using our operating rooms to full capacity. It's a cost choice. There's also all these bad name solutions happening. You've probably heard of travel nurses, agency nursing. We're spending billions of dollars across the country to hire these private staffing agencies to staff our hospitals when we don't have enough staff and then paying a huge differential in wages and a top up to that company for finding the workers. That's a huge cost. And we again don't have data since 2022 in Alberta because why would they share any information with the public? And I want to mention poverty. This is really expensive. It's really upsetting, actually. We got the numbers again recently in Edmonton, where we saw record hospital visits and record frostbite amputations in our operating rooms because of folks living on the street in the winter. We have thousands of people sleeping outside. You cannot be healthy without a home. And the cost to our ERs, to our ambulances, to our operating rooms, to our healthcare system is huge. If we housed people, we could save a whole lot of money on healthcare. So we need to look at our problems in a different way. And I also want to talk about inaction. Every time they ca cancel or delay a hospital, it costs us a heck of a lot more to build it when we finally get around to it. Because guess what? If our population keeps booming, we're going to need more hospital beds and workers if we want to have healthcare. So every time we delay, it costs more. But the other thing we did uh, is we spent $23 million in Edmonton to build this field here, which was supposed to be the lab before they decided to give it to Dynalife instead. So they started building it, tore it down, and flattened it back into a field and spent $23 million on that. Right? So there's money to be found if we want to spend it well. If our priority is private contracts, then I guess we'll spend it stupidly. And I also want to mention that there's ways to save money in the healthcare system by improving it. You know, Pharmacare, which I haven't checked the news, should pass through the Senate today, the new National Pharmacare Act, major news. 
that would save us billions of dollars if we move forward in the country with a universal pharmacare system for all. But even what's on the table that includes diabetes medication would save us thousands of dollars per patient to move forward with that. You know, there's home care. The government talks a lot about keeping folks in their home longer, but they refuse to fund more home care to allow that to happen. That would save us a lot of money. There's dental care, the huge expansion of national dental care with that plan. Over 100,000 Albertans have accessed that plan. And it's saving us a ton of money. The number one hospital visit for children at the children's hospitals is to get surgery for dental issues that weren't treated in a dentist chair. Giving children dental care saves us a lot of money and is better for them as humans. But if you don't care about children, maybe you care about money. So I just want to end on saying we can rebuild our healthcare system. There are solutions. A lot of people are like, where's the hope as they're watching all this happen? You know, there are solutions. We can act. We could act immediately. Here's a long list of things they could do immediately that would help the system, including signing that contract with the doctors so they stop leaving. They could do that today. But I just want to end on this, and then we'll have questions, and I'll have a wrap up, um, is that we've been here before in Alberta. This is why Friends of Medicare was created, and we you know, fought and eventually got the Canada Health Act. Uh, but that's a photo from uh, Calgary. You probably recognize blowing up the Calgary General. The anniversary was the other day of blowing up that hospital. You know, we've been here before. We fought Bill 11. We fought Ralph Klein in the third way. You know, if we organize and work together, we can put forward solutions and fix public health care. All hope is not lost. There's a lot of people who say, well, it clearly doesn't work. We have to do something else. There are things we can do to fix it and rebuild it. Um, so I just want to end on that, that it's, there's a lot to be done and there's examples to look for. And otherwise, we will go to questions uh, and then chat about how you can help us at the end. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we'd like to thank the uh, Lethbridge Senior LSCO who provide this facility for us free. Please patronize the cafeteria. Uh, we'd like to thank the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support, the Lethbridge Herald for their, and other media for their coverage, and a special thank you to Rogers TV for recording our sessions, which then are available on TV and also on uh, the SACBAW uh, archive site. Our speaker next week, on the 16th, is Jim Mitchell. He'll be talking about what can a game warden teach us about wildlife conservation. I'm assuming a lot. Um, so, we just, you know the drill, you line up along there, keep your questions, your comments, your editorial comments brief, and your question to the point. And once you've asked your question, we'd ask you to uh, go back to your seat. So with that, we'll begin. Make sure you give your name. Barb McNeely Sears. Hi, Chris. <laughs> um, concerning, I don't want to dwell on union busting, but the nurses are a very strong force for public good in this province. And if you water and uh, water them down and break the union down. I f I'm f worried that we will lose a, a watchdog and a whistleblower to all the issues. You said that they closed together. What was it? The yeah. So there's who is there to watch? Oh, sorry. Who is there to watch out for that? And also, does that dilute the standards required for all the different? Like they've done this. Like now what, like the nurses have a high standard that they're required for education and there's, there's, anyway, you get what I'm talking about. Like what does that do to all of that? Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks Barb, good to see you, good question. Um, and that's what's happening, right? If you have AHS and you split it into four, you're gonna end up with four bargaining units with four collective agreements. And then if you start contracting out everything underneath that, almost everything that they've contracted out is to a non-union place, all these recovery centers are not unionized facilities, these programs are not unionized, and you're right, it also impacts on the regulation and the oversight. 
and the safety and all of those pieces, right? So it's very much trying to split up the units into as small as possible to reduce their bargaining power, but it's also in terms of things like addictions counselors. You know, HSAA, who represents them, has long called for regulation because it would protect their members to have clear standards, right? And we're going to lose that voice if we keep going down this road. Maria Fitzpatrick, and thanks very much, Chris, for your presentation. So my question is, when um, somebody needs a particular surgery, uh, they're here in Lethbridge, their doctor's here in Lethbridge, there's an operating room here in Lethbridge, but you gotta drive to Cardston. The doctor's gotta drive to Cardston. So that's three hours additional time that that doctor uh, is using to do a surgery that could have been done at the hospital here. What can we do to stop that from happening? Yeah, that's a common story. We need to uh, push to fund our operating rooms to operate more. We're not doing that. We're not using them to full capacity. There's also simple changes we could make that would help, like having a central waiting list so that folks aren't trapped in limbo trying to figure out when they're gonna get an appointment. There's administrative efficiencies we could find in the public hospital system to do more surgeries and to operate more, but they don't want to look at those solutions, they wanna look at the other options, yeah. So my name is Mark Edel. In the example of Dyna, Dyna Life, it takes very highly specialized technical staff to do the lab work. So where did Dyna Life get all these people? Were these the previous public servants that are rehired and were they rehired at the same rate and did they lose their uh, pensions, etc. And then once, Di once Dyna Life uh, folded, were they rehired by the government? Absolutely. And at what cost? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's the, I feel very bad for lab workers in Alberta because they've been thrown back and forth between employers. So it is the same workers. They got turned over to DynaLife. Uh, DynaLife moved very quickly to try to take away their pension, claiming that because there shouldn't be successor rights and they shouldn't have to pay the pension plan. They lost that, and that's one of the main reasons DynaLife wanted out. That was their profit, and they're like, oh, if we have to pay for the pension plan, it's not worth doing. Right, but yeah, it's the same workers who've gone back and forth, back and forth. You know, they've always had HSA as their representation, most of them. But it's like, now your employer's Calgary Public Labs. Oh, now your employer's DynaLife. Oh, now your employer's Alberta Public Labs. It's very stressful on people, and we did lose people in the back and forth. There's some highly specialized folks who work in lab work that said, enough of this, I'm gonna move somewhere else, right? By having all that disruption constantly. And they actually don't know where they're gonna land in this. In this four sectors, labs doesn't appear, and the minister mused that maybe they would try privatizing again with a better contract, right? So there, why would you want to work in labs in Alberta right now with that hanging over your head? Thanks, Chris. I'm Jason Schreiner. You can give me a grade on the editorial. Yeah, make sure I'm not overboard on it. Uh, there's new, um, there's novel sections of the Criminal Code of Canada around um, data sovereignty and crimes against data. Um, uh, this week in Lethbridge, uh, the, the uh, Alberta Court of Justice uh, heard facts on, um, on a crime against data or data-based crime that they've never heard before. So this is the first time locally that these new sections of the code that they heard facts on in an accusation. Um, and it was a medical-based uh, breach. So one of our local um, private um, uh, heart um, clinics had a significant breach where um, uh, an administrative staff um, stole significant data and uh, shipped it to another country. Um, so yeah, um, it's interesting that uh, the first time we've heard facts around this new novel section of the code it, uh, healthcare was targeted. Uh, you mentioned data and the importance of data in this breakdown of the system. Are, are you folks uh, doing anything in and around data sovereignty uh, for healthcare data? I mean, we all, we have the capacity now um, technologically for each one of us to own our data exclusively, to have complete sovereignty over our data, just like we have sovereignty over our bodies. Um, 
But that seems um, that part of our identity is up for grabs, eh? So is this part of your attention? Like, is, it, is this on the radar? Like, you've got lot beautiful things on the radar. Thank you. Thanks for putting all those things up. But is that on the radar for Friends of Medicare, our, our health data and what it means to our personal sovereignty? Yeah. Yeah, there's no shortage of issues for us to work on in Friends of Medicare, if you're surprised to hear that. Um, and it's not just the app I mentioned. You know, there's TELUS Health owns all sorts of data. There's also, as we privatize to more and more clinics, like those heart clinics, they have your data. Even though we created Connect Care that was supposed to help people have better access to their results and their, their own health information, we have these private operators who aren't part of it. I heard a story of someone at an emergency room recently that had been to a private heart clinic and couldn't get their test results because it was the weekend. So then the doctor at the hospital didn't know what the results were as they're trying to get care because they're not connected. So data is a huge issue about who owns it, who controls it, and ultimately as patients, we should have the access to move it around. It shouldn't be in third party hands. Uh, but I'm not an expert on data ownership and transfer. It is an issue that people are very worried about with all these virtual care apps and other things of like who owns what who has access and what's the right to have it deleted and those kind of things, right? Thank you, I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, one piece of information I heard in the last week, our local area, uh, regional area has been told they have to reduce their budget by 17 million. Um, my audience count today is 88, but I was wanted to, ask you to ask our audience, how many have lost their family doctor? Maybe more than once. Yeah, I know, yeah. How many of you are impacted by the two doctors that just announced? I know a couple of you, yeah. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, that's gonna be my wrap up. You stole my thunder. <laughs> uh, my name is Terry Shellington. And it's just a, uh, I have just have a short question. I really appreciate your kind of global uh, view of what's going on. I wonder what kind of a grade you would give the opposition party uh, in terms of its health care critique. Uh, and oh. you have suggestions about what, what the... Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Um, there's a new leader of the opposition. You know, we're nonpartisan at Friends of Medicare and we, we lobby them all. Uh, what gives me hope, they've spoken about healthcare recently. There was kind of a silence over the summer that was concerning. Um, but, you know, even today around the doctors in Lethbridge, I saw Sarah Hoffman talking about that. Um, but I think the appointment of Luann Metz with a new role to look at her role is to create a platform of how we solve healthcare in Alberta. And she's out there meeting with all sorts of folks. I'm sure she would come meet with folks in Lethbridge too. Uh, and that gives me some hope that they're gonna have a thoughtful conversation about, you know, if they win in three years, what are they gonna do with all of this to try to get us somewhere good? Um, so I'm feeling a bit more optimistic with that. Hi, Chris. Ken Sears. Um, over the summer, we were t informed that there's going to be a new medical school in, in Lethbridge and one in the north. Now, that obviously is supposed to produce more doctors, but it's also something I can guarantee we will be hearing a lot from the UCP. Oh, it's going to be okay because there's more doctors coming online. Given the let us say, less than friendly relationship between the UCP and the existing doctors in this province, do you see any reason that the doctors who come through the system in the next six, seven years are going to have any reason at all to stick around? A leading question, and I like it. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, obviously we need a strategy that includes training. Right? We need to train more people into all sorts of health professions. Uh, but you know, we couldn't fill our residencies last year, right? which has never happened before, because people don't see Alberta as a good place to work in healthcare. They just finally announced the agreement for residents yesterday that's been lagging for years to bring us in line with the rest of the country in terms of pay and work conditions. And they still haven't signed the deal with the doctors. Why would they stay here? 
right? You've created a toxic relationship where you're some of the worst paid, you know everyone's short-staffed, the government doesn't listen to you, why wouldn't you move somewhere else? It's very transferable. So even if you do your schooling in Lethbridge, it doesn't mean we'll get to keep a doctor in Lethbridge, right? There, unless there's some incentive or reason to stay here. Uh, so that piece is definitely missing. And it is an issue here. You know, your hospital at the Chinook Regional all summer had service reductions at the ER because lack of doctors. Milk River, Fort McLeod, so on. Who's going to want to walk in and take on that job when they know they're going to be the only one trying to keep the thing open, right? There's a whole piece here where the government needs to take it seriously that doctors are very transferable and movable. They don't have to stay here. So sure, we should train more, but what's your plan to retain them? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Uh, my name's Tom Moffat. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I just went to try and get a vaccine this week, and I wasn't able to, in spite of the government advertising that you can pre-book. Um, and uh, I, I also went for another vaccine because I'm traveling, hepatitis. And I discovered my previous vaccines were not in my medical records, and um, but I had to pay $85 to get that vaccine. So I was wondering if you could comment on the um, state of the government approach to vaccinations here in Alberta. Yeah, well, vaccines are big money for pharmacists now. That's where they've prioritized their efforts. Um, they also just don't want to mention the word vaccine. They're very much pandering to this fringe audience where they, you know, they sort of announced flu vaccines. They wouldn't even say the word COVID. They're like respiratory virus shots are available, right? They're very scared to even admit vaccines are good. We used to see public campaigns saying flu shot season, go get it done. There's the minister getting theirs, you know, signs go up, it's silence. So they're, they're not encouraging it. But the other piece is the fact that clinics and nurse practitioners and doctors aren't even going to get flu and COVID shots this year. And the government likes to pretend that somehow it's Trudeau's fault or something, but they chose not to renew that contract and now we don't have a supplier. That was a choice of the minister that she finally had to admit was her choice to do that because they don't actually want to talk about vaccination and how our vaccination rates are plummeting here in Alberta. So it's going to get harder and harder to access one. I don't know where I'm going to get my flu shot in that this year because I, I don't have a family doctor anymore. So I guess probably shoppers is what's going to end up happening or somewhere like that because uh, they're not making it easy for Alberta's and they're not ever saying that's a good idea. Like where is our health minister or our public health officer in saying flu shots save lives and help our hospital system get one? We're not seeing any of that this year. It's just silence. There was a small announcement you can book, but can you? Hard to find one. You're gonna end up calling every pharmacy in the city to try to get an appointment is where it's headed. Yeah. I have a quick question. You spoke earlier in your presentation about long-term care and what's going on in long-term care. My understanding during COVID that the health outcomes in the publicly run long-term care facilities were much more positive than they were in the privately run long-term care facilities. Would you like to comment on that? That's just absolutely true. Like there's data from across the country, public facilities fare better than for-profit ones because turns out when there's a profit motive, they cut things like staffing, care, resources to make a profit, right? And most of these facilities are publicly funded, so they only have so much money to work with right, because they're funding those patients. So they're always finding a way to chip away at that to make a better profit, right? And so of course the outcomes are worse, whether it's during a pandemic or elsewhere. Knut Peterson is my name. Ideally, uh, it would be better if nobody got sick. And the Premier alluded to that talking about it's a choice whether you get cancer or not. Uh, have you seen any uh, evidence that they are actually putting money into preventative medicine? Yeah, like when you look at poverty, for instance, but all sorts of things, they're not spending money to keep people healthy. And there is very much a culture of just blaming people for being sick that's growing. You see that even through the recovery model, we'll just recover. And if you don't, well, I guess you die, 
right? Like that's the attitude that they're putting forward. It's your own fault if you have an issue, and that's super toxic and concerning. Uh, when we should be investing in people's health, in their housing, and their ability to afford food, all these things that would keep people healthier and out of the hospital system, you know, home care, drugs, dental care, we're not doing any of that. Instead, we're putting it all into the reactionary uh, pieces of the outcomes when people show up at the emergency rooms and that. Yeah. So Mark Edelgan. So healthcare is in trouble not only in Alberta, not in our other provinces, but in many places around the world. Is there a model somewhere in the world that we should emulate where it's working well and would work well here too? Yeah, there is a healthcare workforce issue basically everywhere right now. You know, there's been a generational thing happening that we've known about and did nothing about, and then a pandemic blew it all up. Um, but there's endless evidence that shows public systems outperform for-profit systems. You know, we just have to look south of the border to know what we shouldn't do, yet that's the road we're on. Um, but really, you know, there's some places taking the workforce issue more seriously than others, and they're seeing success with retention and recruitment. Um, Part of my job is reading a lot of healthcare articles, and I'm just inundated with ads of where I could work as a healthcare worker because it assumes I'm a nurse or something. Uh, there are huge incentives right now to go elsewhere, and there's no incentives in Alberta to stay, let alone recruit. Um, so really, it's about the workforce piece, regardless of how their system's funded or structured, that folks who can figure out how to retain and recruit and train folks have a more successful system right now. Hi, my name's David Major. Um, it might take me a second to put this in context, but to me, I think the, the UCP uh, pitches to the population the savings that they're going to make, and by not funding health and education properly. So my question is, if you took your like uh, Mark's suggestion, to become a place where we aren't in crisis, how much would that cost, and how would you pitch that to the population so that, well, the NDP, for example, would get elected? Because, well, maybe you can also answer the question, why do we keep electing these guys? <laughs> Wow. Well, I'm from Edmonton, so you would have to answer that. Uh, down here in Lethbridge East, for instance. Um, but it's true. Every time the government uh, talks about one of these privatization schemes, they're like, it's going to save us money, it's going to improve care, and it's going to shorten wait lists. And after they do it, all three of those things do not come true. Every single time. It costs us more, the wait list grows, it makes things worse. Over and over. So in terms of the money, we would save money by doing things better, but we do need right now an injection of money to stabilize everything. You know, the doctors since last fall have very clearly said, this is what will keep family medicine going, do it. And I don't know the costing of it off the top of my head, but they're like, here's the model, doctors would stay if you did it. So that's the amount of money we should invest in that. You know, the nurses who are meeting today to talk about their bargaining have very clear demands that involve retention they could do that. And when we're at the point where the Pinoka News the other day, the newspaper there, had an editorial that was titled, just give them the money, there's money. We have money, we have a huge surplus. Short term, we need to stabilize things because it's gonna cost us way more to try to fix it three years from now, five years from now, if we don't spend that money now. But it's complicated because some of the things we do, once we spend the money, we'll save money. So to give you like a big number of what it would take, it's like, that would take someone like Luan costing it all out and then telling me the answer. <laughs> Before I retired, I worked in health care, basically in population health, and that focus of that whole program, of course, is health promotion, injury prevention, all of those things. Shortly after they created the super board, as they called it at the time, all the population health departments just disappeared. There is a, lots of research to show that putting money into prevention saves the healthcare system money. I'd like you to comment on that somehow. 
Yeah. And there's all sorts of reports that I can't remember the numbers from, but uh, you know, if you invest in prevention, you save like multiple dollars back per dollar in the healthcare system. Diabetes is so clear, and that's what's on the table at the Senate today. Universal coverage for insulin and equipment, that's something like $1,400 a patient saves the healthcare system, knowing that people are managing their chronic condition properly, that they're not ending up in the ER. You know, you look at universal healthcare overall, and it's billions of dollars if we just covered medications for everyone. And then there's also bulk buying and all sorts of other savings within that. And, you know, medications are preventative care, because when people don't take the proper medication, they end up at the hospital or calling an ambulance or so on, or with worse health conditions. So there's endless examples where if we tried to keep people healthier, we would save a whole lot of money in the healthcare system, which also should be our goal. Like our goal of our government should be a healthier society. That's why they should exist. You know, we should be housed, we should have food, we should be able to afford to live, and we should try to keep people as healthy as possible for as long as possible. And that's not the priority we're seeing right now. It's profit, right? So you're so, tr you're so right with that. Uh, this is, my name's Kathleen Clements. Um, this is probably a very naive question, but uh, how, the Alberta government is Norman the doorman. What, how much clout does the federal government have to stop, curtail, hold back money, whatever, to the provincial government to say you can't do this? Yeah. 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 So sadly, our federal government has refused to do that. We've called for that with every announcement of funding to tie strings to it, and they don't. They cave every time to the provinces. So there's long-term care funding that we've got, but they didn't make them adopt the new national standards to get it, right? There's been example after example where federal money's coming into Alberta, and there's not even a requirement that they actually spend it on health care, really, when it comes down to it. And we've seen things like the dental care, where the Premier says she's going to try to opt us out of this national plan that she doesn't pay for or administer. Uh, there's no opt-out process, because why would there be? The Prime Minister should just say, no, go away. People get dental care, move on. They have that power, and they should also enforce the Canada Health Act in this province. You know, we are getting clawbacks for violating the Act on MRI testing and that, but there are membership clinics. They're clearly a violation. People are being charged for tests that are insured tests. That's clearly a violation of the act. The federal government should actually enforce the act, but they're so scared right now of anything, their shadow it seems, uh, that they won't come after these provinces who are actively destroying healthcare with federal dollars. But they cut. My name is Gordon Lee. Uh, Chris, these contracts that are being um, <coughs> signed between uh, private enterprise corporations and the government or, you know, these sub-clinics and so on, um, these are long-term contracts. And um, for what I know of contracts, they usually involve clauses such as um, renewable and um, first uh, and exclusive renewable, so that uh, whoever owns the contract now at its expiry, which might be five years, ten years, whatever, they have <coughs> the first choice of renewing it if they wish, or otherwise it'll be recontracted. So these contracts are long term, uh, not just a couple of years, uh, certainly beyond the next election date. Um, and they're renewable, renewable by the corporations uh, that uh, currently are the contractee. So what, in terms of uh, the power of the people, <laughs> if such remains, can be done to alter, uh, change, reverse, whatever this process, which is uh, taking place right now, and. Uh, will exist for the foreseeable future despite changes in government or or whatever what, what is your view of this what, what i mean i i feel powerless uh, in all of this you know i i have done for a long time about many things but nevertheless what can be done yeah, fair. yeah i'm oddly hopeful this week you get the hopeful version um 
But you're right, and Jason Copping, the former health minister before the last election, made that very clear. Because one thing about privatization is we don't get to see the contracts. We don't know what's in them, we don't know what we're paying, we don't know the terms, we don't know how to get out of them, because the public doesn't get to know. Uh, but the minister Copping at the time told us going into the election that the surgical contracts were long-term with guaranteed volumes. They were ensuring that that was in place before an election, which also means there's a perverse incentive now because we have to pay for those volumes, that if there's only one anesthesiologist, it's actually in our interest to send them to the private surgical center to work there that day because we're paying either way, which means more surgeries get canceled in hospitals. So we've actually set up the contracts to undermine hospitals, but I digress. In terms of getting out of them, um, the successes I've seen happen are just making it unprofitable for them and they'll leave because they're only there to make money. You know, when Dynalife couldn't make the money they thought they would, they walked away. They asked us to buy them back out. They didn't want to do it anymore. And we saw that with long-term care in Ontario. When Ontario said they're going to adopt the national long-term care standards and improve care, a whole bunch of private operators said we're closing because it's not profitable if they actually have to staff it and care for people. So great, go away, right? Like put in standards, make them meet them, and if they're not willing, they can leave and we'll run it publicly. This incentivized preventative care. Mm -hmm. yeah. This will be the last question. Thanks again, Chris. Okay, I, I, um, I want to say this as a warning. Um, we have uh, money that comes from the feds to pay for provincial, uh, provincially operated uh, programs. So we have to worry about our provincial government, what they're going to do. We also have to worry about what happens in the next federal election based on what one of the leaders is saying about pharmacare, dental care, our health care overall, who also feels that, you know, if you get diabetes, it's your fault. So, uh, any comments about that? This could be your wrap -up. Yeah, oh, it's my, you want me to wrap up at the same time? Okay, yeah, we should all worry about every election, uh, but one is coming sooner than others. Uh, and we do have a conservative leader who's made it very clear he's gonna take it all away. Yeah, um, so that's concerning. You know, when we have over 100,000 seniors in Alberta accessing the dental care plan, uh, to rip that away from people, I think is cruel. So, we should all talk about that more. Uh, in terms of a wrap up, I just wanna say, um, two things. First, Friends of Medicare will soon be launching a campaign this fall to talk about what's happening. We cannot wait three years, hope for a new government, and move on. We need to actually organize now to start fighting for our public health care and for solutions. So we're going to talk about how we stop the destruction that's happening and talk about how we rebuild the system put out solutions and get out there in the community. Talk about that. We're working on that right now. Uh, and it's going to be all across the province for over many months because we need to get out to people more and more in their community, where they live, get them on board. And I can tell you that there is interest in this. You know, this room today shows that, but my email inbox is like impossible to keep up on. Our phone is off the hook. People in communities I'd never heard of want to talk about healthcare because their ER is closed. You know, there is a huge interest right now and opportunity to talk to people about solutions and to say what they're doing is not a solution. And the fact they're selling it to you as that is a lie. And we're going to get out there and we're going to do that work. So I ask of all of you, there's a table just outside the door. It has information on how you can join Friends of Medicare. Anyone in Alberta can join if you want to. There's also some issue cards on things like home care, on dental care, pharma care, seniors care, and so on, where you can take action, you can sign up, you can take them and give them out. Because our goal is to reach as many people as possible across the province. Because the public is on board. And we've done some, re we didn't do it, the Canadian Health Coalition did, but did some polling recently to ask folks. And Albertans are no different than anywhere else in the country, in spite of how we vote sometimes, in terms of supporting a public system, in huge majorities. They think the solutions are public. They think the solutions are supporting the workforce. They don't believe Danielle Smith can be trusted to fix the healthcare system. They are on board. We need to get to them, but I need all of you to help us to do that. You know, Friends of Medicare, we're now up to three staff from two. Huge expansion uh, at Friends of Medicare. Uh, it feels amazing, um, but, but we need all of you to join, to sign up, to share our stuff, to talk to folks, to invite us out to folks, because if we can reach people, we absolutely can stop what they're doing, and we can fix things. But we need you to do that, because the three of us can't do it alone. And I'll just say, for contrast, we were looking, I won't name the group, there's this right-wing front 
group that pushes private health care uh, in Canada, and we were looking, and they have 14 full-time staff. And they're just like a front entity that doesn't like have any real members. We have three, and it's all based on you all supporting us. So please join us, become a member, sign up for our emails, check out our table, talk to Mitchell, who's here in the front room, or me, about how you can get involved. Come to our local chapter meeting uh, at 2 o'clock at the library, two thir 3 o'clock, I'm getting ahead of myself, at the library. Come by the OWL tonight, where we're going to be hanging out. Get it at 6 o'clock, see, I don't know the times, I'm just going place to place. Um, come join us, invite others to join us, because uh, that's how we're going to win this. You know, you know, we can wait out a government if we fight back. So, yeah, thank you everyone for giving me the time and inviting me back.